Morning, Chris Ole, Lake Forest Baptist Health, Infectious Diseases. Second week of September. Wow, middle of September is almost here. Um, and with that, uh, we got through Labor Day. Um, and so far, um, the post Labor Day or the post holiday bump that we usually see in cases hasn't been too striking. Still got a couple days to sort it all out because it takes a while for the reporting to go through. But um, across the country, um, it's uh, if you look at the at the graphs, um, they're uh, they're peaking or have peaked. In fact, a lot of states are starting to come down. Some even in the south have to be a little careful with Louisiana because there's some reporting problems there after the hurricane. But um, um, even Mississippi and Alabama are slowly declining. Um, there are some cases, states that are going up still slowly. Um, South Carolina, West Virginia, Tennessee, um, so, uh, and parts of Georgia still. So if it feels like North Carolina is surrounded a bit by a lot of COVID, um, by a territorial way, <laughs> I guess it is. Here in North Carolina, we've been pretty uh, pretty steady um, over the last week or so. Um, not much uh, not much change. I think we had a 1% increase over the last seven days. Uh, in fact, some of the counties that had had really high rates, above 120 per 100,000 um, per, uh, per day is now, um, they're starting to slowly come down. Here in the triad, we're be kind of stuck right around 55, 56 per 100,000 um, per day, which is uh, significantly lower still than what we were in January, and I think that's where our peak is going to end up being. Um, in um, our hospitals are still um, still kind of tight, um, and uh, um, you can get a bed if you need one, um, but uh, occasionally elective surgeries need to be postponed. Um, in our system anyway. Um, it's an unusual occurrence and if you have something scheduled you'll get a call. If you don't get a call um, then show up for your pre-op appointment as usual um, because it means that it's uh, still going to go on. And the hospitals are still safe places to get your surgery and, uh, and to get your medical care. Emergency departments are busy. It's, all, it's not all just COVID um, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of trauma, a lot of things going on in the ED, so the ED waits are a little bit longer. So if you're looking just to get a COVID test or you have a minor medical problem um, and you really don't need emergency care, that's not probably where I'd go to get it. You're going to end up waiting a while because we triage um, and we take care of the sicker people first um, when they go to the emergency department. Still uh, over 90% of the people who are in our hospitals uh, through our health system are unvaccinated and 95% of the people in the ICU uh, and even higher if, uh, if on ventilators. So as far as hospitalizations, it's still largely, um, still largely a problem with unvaccinated people. Every now and then a vaccinated person um, might um, still get hospitalized uh, and get severe COVID. It occurs. It's an unusual occurrence. Usually when it does happen, there's an underlying medical condition that's under it um, that makes that person at a bit higher risk. But even then it's still an unusual occurrence. And death uh, due to COVID in a vaccinated person the rate is about 0.008% compared to the 2% for the population at large. So um, the vaccines are hanging in there for severe disease, hospitalization, and death, uh, and that's a good thing. One thing that's a little different um, now um, and uh, compared to what we had last spring is where a lot more kids are getting COVID. Um, and it's kind of resembling how the colds and flus go through um, kids' um, communities um, and populations. In fact, I was just talking to Joshua Swift, our uh, health director, yesterday. Almost a third of all of our uh, daily cases now here in Forsyth County are in children. Um, and it's not, you know, first people say, oh, yeah, it's, they're back in school, that's why. It's, 
it's really not the schools, it's not the classroom, it's not the cafeterias where, um, where transmission's occurring. It's occurring in, in, um, in our kids in the, um, in the after school activities, uh, particularly after school sports. And uh, you've probably seen in the local media here how some uh, high school teams and, uh, and middle school teams have, uh, have been struggling a little bit with COVID. Um, and uh, having to postpone games uh, or cancel games because of it. Um, not much different than the, what it was for our colleges last year and, uh, and even the NFL um, for football last year. So this year, uh, this year the high schools are having to figure out what to do. Um, as far as uh, is, is, is the Delta variant more severe in kids? We're still, we still don't know for sure. And I, I can tell you one thing in medicine, that if something is really obvious, um, usually it's, it comes up and, um, and you figure it out pretty quickly. So the longer it takes to get, um, the longer it takes to get information to find out something like that, it means that the impact of it's probably not very high. So um, for by far and away, kids getting COVID are still getting very mild infections. Usually after a few days, it's, it's they're done. Um, and the main problem is, is they're out of school uh, for 10 days and you're having to do home virtual learning. Um, hospitalizations here in the triad are up a little bit in kids, um, but not, not tremendously so. Um, we have a, a handful of, uh, of under 18 uh, in the children's hospital right now. Uh, for the most part, they have underlying medical problems um, or underlying um, uh, medical conditions that predispose them um, for more severe COVID. Um, so, um, the, but uh, luckily the numbers are still very low um, here in the triad for hospitalized kids and that's good. Um, and uh, it just reflects when you have a larger number of people, then if a small percentage get hospitalized, that number will go up a few, little bit too. So I've been asked uh, what schools can do with their sports teams to help get them through. There's, there's a few things um, that they can do. One is, is they can test. And this was uh, actually uh, proven um, in several instances, all published by the CDC last spring, mostly with spring sports, soccer, um, volleyball, and other sports in the upper Midwest, when they were in the middle of a big surge um, up in Minnesota um, and Wisconsin and North Dakota. And so they started testing their school sports teams. And by doing so, you get an idea of, uh, of where on the team your positive cases are and you can start to see some relationship between them. And it helps with quarantining um, and it uh, then um, as time goes on, um, you don't get the positive cases anymore on the team because they, um, they've been sorted and quarantined out and the virus diminishes in the team. So weekly testing uh, is one thing that a sports team can do to get through the season. The other thing um, is that when you are not actually doing the sport itself, um, you wear masks. So you wear masks on the sidelines. Um, you wear masks while you're uh, getting your pep talks from the coaches. Um, you wear masks when you're doing the activities surrounding the sporting event. And then lastly, while it's not with the sports team itself, but within the spectators, bleachers get crowded, people are closed in. So even though you're outside, you should be wearing a mask uh, for spectators for our fall sports. And then, uh, and then you need to be really careful with all of the uh, social activities that surround the sports, uh, the spaghetti dinner um, before the cross country meet, um, the post football game, pizza party, um, so on and so forth. There's also a lot of activities that go on, particularly with high schools, um, that occur after school and around school. And carpooling and riding around together, um, while it might be a great place to have some privacy, 
away from the parents and uh, and talk amongst your friends. Being in a car without a mask on is probably one of the best ways to transmit COVID if you wanted to do it. Um, and so, um, so it's an activity to think about. Open the windows. Um, so breakthrough infections, uh, we're learning a little bit more about them. Um, and uh, a, a study that came out this week, uh, which really was in that category of, yeah, we figured it all along, um, but uh, that older people and people who have frail health are more likely to have a breakthrough infection with COVID that's severe that lands them in the hospital. It's still an unusual event, but, um, but uh, that's, um, that's the group of people um, to think about. And that will be um, the first group of people that we start to quote um, boost or provide a third shot for them. Um, and, uh, and so it'll be nursing home people and people who are frail and older. Um, and I think we'll, we'll see that start to happen. Regarding boosters for, uh, for the rest of us, um, by the way, I, I got boosted in the last two weeks. I got COVID, as most people know. Um, and I really appreciate all of the, uh, the emails and the thoughts on, on the social media um, from people. Um, I, I really felt loved by the community, and uh, so that was great. But I, I had a, a minor kick, COVID cold. I've had worse colds, I've had worse flus. Wouldn't want to do it again because no one wants to be sick. Um, but um, but it was um, certainly uh, because I was vaccinated. It made it a uh, a lot more uh, easy experience to get through. Uh, and certainly, I didn't end up in the hospital. Didn't need any extra meds. In fact, I ended up still working a lot while ill. So. Um, I'll uh, attribute that all to the vaccine. And uh, so go get vaccinated if you haven't yet. Um, the, uh, whether or not everyone else will get a booster um, or a third shot, we're gonna wait and see how that all plays out. It's not quite as straightforward as one might think. Um, and one thing to think about, um, and, um, and we'll see how the, um, ACIP and the NIH fit this in. But there are right now in preparation Delta-specific boosters um, and Delta-specific uh, vaccines that include all the other variants that we've had but add special oomph for Delta. And there's a larger and larger group of infectious diseases and vaccine people who think that the Delta is the one that's going to provide still the greatest fitness for transmission in populations. And we want to make sure that if Delta mutates a couple more times that we can still cover it. And it looks like if you build the Delta base based on the Delta we have now that if another mutation occurs it's still covered by a Delta booster. It's possible that if you get boosted with the current vaccine soon, like say October 1, if it might be available, or for some of those people who are just going out and grabbing it on the, on the go at, at one of the pharmacies, even though it's not officially sanctioned yet, it could be that it'll diminish your response to the Delta booster. Because there's something in the world of vaccines that if you get vaccinated too much um, with the vaccine too many times, that it can reduce the effectiveness of, a, of a, a booster that's modified specifically for a certain strain. So um, I'm still asking people, if you're thinking of getting that third dose, hold off, wait for the data, wait for the FDA, wait for the ACIP and the CDC to say how we should do it, because it's a little bit more complicated than you might think. Um, regarding um, w the best treatments for COVID for outpatients right now, there really, really aren't any. 
um, that are um, easy to do. What we're looking for is that Tamiflu, that COVID, a pill for COVID that you can get a prescription for and go to the doctor. Those trials are still ongoing. Some of them look encouraging actually for both uh, treatment and prevention of COVID. Um, and uh, we'll see, I'm hoping that we'll have some, uh, some light on the end of that tunnel um, as we get into the next year. In the interim, there's monoclonal antibodies. And what is a monoclonal antibody is a, uh, uh, an antibody that is directed against the spike protein on the COVID virus that's manufactured instead of made by a, you know, a vaccine. So a vaccine basically has your body make a potpourri of antibodies to the spike protein. A monoclonal is a manufactured antibody and it usually only hits one specific part or two specific parts uh, on the spike protein. Monoclonal antibodies do, um, uh, do reduce the amount of COVID that you can find in a person's blood or in their respiratory tract if you give it to them in somebody who has COVID. And it also um, reduces the chance that, they'll, that their COVID will go on to become severe enough to become in the hospital. So roughly somewhere, if you treat 13 to 15 people with a monoclonal antibody, you'll save one hospitalization. And so, as I mean, that's not insignificant. Um, it's not a magic bullet, but it's not insignificant. Um, and so it's something for people to think about. Who should, who should get a monoclonal antibody as treatment for their COVID? Uh, basically people who um, have um, reasons um, that they would, might have more severe COVID. So kind of if you go down the pecking order, um, the person you would really like to give it to is either a vaccinated or unvaccinated severely immunocompromised person because they don't respond to vaccines as well. And they could deal with how they, they could benefit from having some of these manufactured antibodies that are infused. The other group of people would be severely immunocompromised people who had a significant exposure to COVID. So let's say somebody's getting um, uh, treatment for lymphoma or leukemia or some other cancer that's very immunocompromising or has had a bone marrow transplant and then one of their close household family members gets COVID. Um, and then we can give it to them for prevention of them to get COVID. Um, then the third group would be people who are uh, unvaccinated and have underlying medical conditions, uh, such as uh, being overweight, uh, having asthma, uh, having heart disease, kidney disease, um, and um, so on and so forth. Um, people who are um, in the extremes of age, they would benefit. Who would probably benefit the least are people who've been previously vaccinated, particularly previous vaccinated people who are otherwise healthy. So um, if you've been previously vaccinated and you get COVID, um, you likely don't need a monoclonal antibody. And um, so that's something to think about. All our health systems are infusing monoclonal antibodies. There's two ways to get it. One way is to get it by vein with the needle and the other way is to get it by some shots in the stomach, kind of like you would get insulin. Um, the, um, so it's something to talk with your doctor about if you get COVID. Um, a little bit about travel. I know a lot of people are being excited to get on, go on some fall trips um, and uh, the hot places to go right now, believe it or not, it's Africa. <laughs> People are going to do their safaris, a lot of outdoor time, um, and, uh, and the travel restrictions aren't quite so onerous. Um, a few things to think about. Um, you really need to check um, the destination where you're going and, and, and check frequently, particularly with their embassy. Um, because most places are gonna require uh, either that you get tested before you go or that you're vaccinated um, in order to go. 
and uh, some will require both and the testing can get a little bit nitpicky um, so is it usually it's 72 hours but it could be 72 hours before your departure or it could be 72 hours before your arrival so it's a long flight that added time might put you over um, and the other thing you need to think about is where you're going to get that test because right now testing is a little bit harder to get kind of like what it was earlier in the pandemic and the turnaround time to get them back is longer um, so um, check with the available testing areas uh, in your air in your region um, as, as to how you can get a, a test back quickly some places will take an antigen test most places will take just a, only a PCR so you have to mind the attention to the details. Europe is kind of getting all over the place, whether or not they'll let um, people from the U.S. in. Um, some countries won't uh, let us in at all, such as Sweden. Um, Italy requires you to, um, to isolate or quarantine yourself. Even if vaccinated, um, according to some of the reports I've been getting, for five days. Supposedly, uh, technically, it's only the unvaccinated who have to do that, but I've heard differently. Um, and then um, the Netherlands, for instance, um, you have to isolate whether vaccinated or not when you get there. So it may not be a great time to visit Europe. France is still pretty open, Germany's still pretty open, Germany and um, Spain is still pretty open. But keep an eye on that, particularly if you have unrefundable tickets. Um, it might get a little pricey if your trip gets canceled. So um, lastly, uh, I mentioned it last week, and I'm going to um, mention it again. Um, I, oh, there's two things I need to bring up. I got a question about Novavax's vaccine, so we'll talk about that first. So Novavax, if you remember, like three months ago, um, I was saying that this vaccine looked like it was effective. It was 97, 90% uh, protective against, um, against symptomatic COVID at that time. That was a lot of that was pre-Delta, but still not bad. And uh, it's a vaccine made with the usual technology how we make a lot of other vaccines like hepatitis B, uh, Shingrix, um, so on and so forth. And so um, the, um, I thought that it would have been submitted to the FDA by now, at least I did think that last May or June. But it turns out the, the companies run into a lot of manufacturing problems, regulatory problems with that, and are having trouble getting ingredients. And it now looks like Novavax's vaccines probably not even, even gonna ever get marketed in the United States. It looks like they made a, bi a business decision to go to other places in the world and other markets with their vaccine. So it's a global economy, and so companies make decisions. Um, so maybe the hidden good news on that is the, uh, the uh, people who do the, uh, the math and all the business people behind making vaccines see that there's more of a chance to sell vaccine in other countries than here. Um, but um, that was their decision. They do have an interesting new vaccine though that actually is a combination of their vaccine and the flu vaccine together. And it is possible that we may see that being used as a booster vaccine um, for certain um, indications. So it would make sense, right, as we go down the road a year or two that you get a booster for your flu shot and for your COVID at the same time. Um, and it would be a lot easier. So the other thing I was gonna talk about is ivermectin again. Um, so, you know, uh, some, you may not be aware, but I do a lot of tropical medicine. That's sort of my area, emerging infections and tropical medicine within the world of infectious diseases. So I've used ivermectin. I've used ivermectin for treating worms. I've used it for treating loa loa. Uh, I've used it for treating river blindness. I've used it for treating um, uh, Norwegian scabies and uh, some other of these entities. Have I ever used it for treating COVID? Uh, no. 
And uh, based on the data that I'm, more and more data that I'm seeing, I'll never use it very likely. It is not a drug that treats COVID. It's not an antiviral. It's really not even a good anti-inflammatory. It's a great worm drug. Um, so if you've got a worm, it's a good drug for you. But uh, for if you've got COVID, it's not. Nor is it a good drug for preventing COVID. Um, and so it is not a substitute for vaccination. Um, and I say that with all bias aside, um, I've read the 22 studies now that are out with ivermectin. There's a couple, three that were horribly flawed that might have suggested it work. But the other 19 of them basically is, uh, is slams it down. It's, it doesn't work for COVID. Um, so uh, the other part about it is their downsides, particularly for people who decide to uh, go out and get it on their own or take high doses for prevention. It, it can make you pretty sick if you take too much of it. Um, and in fact, we've had um, a, a big spike in increases to the poison hotline um, all over the country, not just around here. So uh, stay away from ivermectin unless you have a worm. Um, so uh, that's that. So with that, I thought I'd just uh, um, open it up for questions, if there are any. Oh, my mic fell. <laughs> you should have stopped me earlier. I need to fill Oh. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. I'm still getting sound, so it's not a problem. Okay, good. So, do you have any questions, though? I don't. Have <laughs> okay. <laughs> any other questions from the group? No. All right. We'll see you next week.